Did you know that up to 71% of Parkinson's patients experience urinary symptoms? From urgency to frequency, these problems can seriously impact the quality of life. And here's something really important. Urinary incontinence is not a normal part of aging. If you or someone you care about is facing these challenges, you're not alone. Today, we'll unpack why these issues happen, what they mean for Parkinson's patients, and how you can manage them. Hi, I'm Kim. Thank you so much for um, clicking on this video. I talk a lot about Parkinson's on this channel. It's basically a uh, focus on, from a daughter's perspective, my mother had Parkinson's disease. Uh, she has recently passed away, but I'm going to continue making these videos because I have a ton of information to share and hopefully it will help someone. Um, anyways, today's focus is on urinary issues, which is a topic that doesn't get enough attention in my opinion. It's incredibly common in Parkinson's and in non-Parkinson's. Uh, whether you're dealing with urgency, frequency, incontinence, or the inability to empty the bladder completely, I'm going to tell you all about different tips, treatments, and important information that will hopefully help. Okay. Why are urinary issues so common in Parkinson's disease? Well, the di this disease affects the substantia nigra, which is where dopamine is produced. But it's also near the urinary control center in the brain called the pontine micturition center. I'll say that fast. Pontine micturition center. I'm probably pronouncing it wrong. Anyways, this connection explains why up to 71% of Parkinson's patients experience these problems. They can experience urgency, which is the feeling like you need to go immediately, frequency, which means you go to the bathroom far more often than usual, nocturia, which is waking up multiple times at night to urinate. This is something that more than 60% of Parkinson's patients deal with regularly. This was my mom's main issue. Um, these symptoms are caused by disruptions in the communication between the brain, the bladder, and the muscles that control urination. So there are different types of urinary problems in Parkinson's, and here's what can go wrong with the bladder. So it can be a problem with the bladder itself. The bladder may not store urine properly, leading to urgency and frequency. It might also contract for the wrong reasons, causing spasms or overactive bladder. It can be new to illness or age. There could be a problem with the sphincter or the valve which would be weakness in the muscles that control the bladder outlet, which can cause leaks. Hyperactive sphincters might not relax all the way, making it hard to empty the bladder. This also can be due to age or a neurologic cause. Parkinson's, anyone? Uh, there could be wiring problems. Parkinson's can disrupt signals from the brain, so the bladder and the sphincter don't work together properly. And you may not feel like you need to go, but you do. And by the time you realize that you do, you don't have time to get to the bathroom. Now, if you're leaking urine, it could be due to weak pelvic floor muscles, a bladder contracting at the wrong time, or miscommunication between the brain and the bladder. On the other hand, difficulty urinating might mean the bladder isn't squeezing effectively. There's an obstruction, or maybe the, sph the sphincter isn't relaxing. Now, there are dangers of these urinary problems, specifically in Parkinson's patients. So urinary symptoms aren't just annoying. They can be dangerous. Here's why it's crucial to address them. Falls. Okay, this is a leading cause of injury. Rushing to the bathroom, especially at night, increases the risk of falling. Higher burden of care. Incontinence might require more care, like diapers or catheterization quality of life. Frequent trips to the restroom can be disruptive and embarrassing. Institutionalization. In severe cases, managing these issues might lead to needing nursing home care. My mom's urinary problems started about a year before she passed away. They were 
progressively getting worse and worse. It started with just having to get up a few times at night, to rushing during the day, to not being able to hold it. Um, it, it became more and more disruptive to her quality of life. So I've learned quite a bit about this. So there's different types of incontinence. They're all equally uncomfortable and may cause concern, but don't worry. There are many ways to manage these problems, and I'm going to walk you through those in a minute. So the different types that um, I found were stress incontinence, which is basically pressure on the bladder. So the leaking is caused by this pressure, coughing, jumping, etc. Then there's urgency incontinence, which is the sudden urge to go. And you can't make it to the bathroom in time. Continuous incontinence usually comes from a hole in the bladder or something like that. They say this is very uncommon. Uh, Functional incontinence, which means you need to urinate. You know you need to urinate, but can't get there due to a cast or something like that. So you're unable to get to the bathroom, um, even though you know that you need to. And then overflow incontinence means your bladder is just simply full and it leaks. So before you can treat the symptoms, the doctors will need to know exactly what's going on. A proper diagnosis is the first step in finding a way to treat you. When you see a doctor about urinary issues, they'll start by reviewing your medical history and performing tests, asking you questions, etc. Some of the tests they may do would be a urinalysis. They're going to check for infections or any other conditions. A bladder ultrasound could be done. They might do this to see if you're emptying your bladder completely. Now, my mom, her doctor, she went to a gynecological urologist. He was fantastic. He did a thing where she would go to the bathroom, you know, try to completely empty her bladder, and then go sit in the room for about 10 minutes. He would come in and put a catheter in, and see how much volume was still in her bladder when after she thought that she had already gone. Uh, surprisingly, there was quite a bit. So um, that's how he knew she was not emptying her bladder properly. Um, anyways, back to what I was talking about. The um, that was so. I guess some doctors do it an ultrasound. Her doctor just did it that way. The next thing they might use for diagnosis is a voiding diary. So they basically track when when and how much you urinate and when and how much you drink. I guess you keep track and give it to them. Um, There are advanced tests like urodynamics and cytoscopy, which may be um, ordered if needed. Now, don't despair. There are treatment options out there and a few different ones. No two people are the same and what works for one person may not work for the next. The doctors can try various things to help with the symptoms. There are prevention and behavioral strategies, lifestyle changes, medications, and some advanced treatments. Whatever you do, don't ignore your incontinence. Um, Extended urine Contact with skin can cause deterioration and some serious problems. It's important to keep the area clean and dry. And go to your doctor to try to get some help. Now, the first category of treatments are prevention and behavioral strategies. They suggest timed voiding. Go to the bathroom on a schedule, even if you don't feel like you have to. Um, My mom was told to try this. She was supposed to go while she was awake every two hours. And whether she felt like she needed to or not, just go. And then you could do bladder retraining, which is gradually increase the time between bathroom trips. Uh, We never got that far, but you could do start at two hours and then then go up to three hours between each time and four hours, etc. Then there are pelvic floor exercises like Kegels to strengthen bladder control. I think you should do that before you have incontinence and maybe that will keep your bladder strong. The next category is lifestyle changes. You should avoid irritants like alcohol, caffeine, spicy foods, and diuretics. 
Stay hydrated, but drink most of your fluids early in the day. It's funny, I do that personally because I don't want to be up all night going to the bathroom. So by like 7 p.m., I try not to drink anything. I drink a lot during the day, but then I cut myself off. <laughs> um, the easiest way to proceed would be with lifestyle changes, right? You just make little changes to your everyday life. Some will help. It may not help, uh, but it's definitely not going to hurt you. So these, it's worth trying some of these things. The next category is medications. There are anticholinergics. Anticholinergics. <laughs> oh my goodness. However you say that. Anyways, they can reduce urgency but may aggravate Parkinson's symptoms. So make sure that your doctor is really aware of your symptoms. Especially if you go to a urologist and they don't know much about Parkinson's disease, um, you may need to give them a little bit of information so that they don't give you medication that's going to make your symptoms worse. The next type of medications are beta-3 agonists. This is a newer option with fewer side effects, and um, these are recommended. Now, not everyone can be helped with meds, but it's worth a try. My mom tried two or three different medications, and they didn't do anything for her. So um, you just never know. Everybody's different. Now, there are some advanced treatments. So the first one is Botox injections. These can reduce bladder spasms. Now, this treatment will need to be repeated a couple times a year, but for some people, it really helps. My mom did not get relief from Botox. Um, instead, it made it very difficult for her to empty her bladder. That's how we started doing that test where they could see how much was left in her bladder, and it was a lot. Um, so she ended up being very uncomfortable, more uncomfortable than she was before we had the Botox. Um, but to her, it was with a try because a lot of people did get benefit from the Botox. So she wanted to give that a shot. I think the Botox paralyzed her bladder muscles and that's why she was unable to empty her bladder properly. Now, the good part or the bad part, however you want to look at it, is that it wears off. So if you end up like my mom, it's only a few months before it wears off and then you're back to how you were. But if it does work for you and you want to do it again, you have to go through the whole procedure again. Um, I should probably do a video just purely on that whole um, procedure and what it entails and things. I will. Anyways, the next advanced treatment is nerve stimulation therapies like PTNS or Interstim. They may help regulate bladder activity. Um, we did not try any of those. The doctor did mention that there were several different types of advanced therapies, but my mom ended up declining and um, passing away. We never got to try anything else, but um, yeah. In severe cases, catheters or surgery might be necessary. Now, urinary issues can feel embarrassing but they're incredibly common, even among healthy individuals. For Parkinson's patients who have mobility issues, it just feels worse. Um, but these problems don't have to define your life. Talk to your doctor, explore your options, and don't hesitate to seek help. If this video helped you, please give it a thumbs up and share it with someone who might benefit. And don't forget to subscribe. I also love comments. If you have anything to add to the conversation or questions about any urinary issues or if you think something I said is incorrect, please put it in the comments below. Uh, I think we can learn a lot from each other. Together, we can navigate this journey and support each other and learn, right? So thank you so much for watching. And remember, you're not alone in this. Take care and I'll see you in the next video.